Okay, you can start. So today is uh, approach to jaundice and uh, uh, approach will be presented by Dr. Sanjay from PSG. And uh, afterwards, uh, we'll have the case. First, we'll have case discussion followed by the seminar. Over to Dr. Sanjay. You can present. Meanwhile, when I get that presentation, you can try to send it to me once again. Just make sure okay, the mail is second. correct. See yes, whether sir. it is in the outbox or somewhere. Trapped or somewhere. Send it, sir. Approach to John. It is sent, sir. It's okay, showing. now you can start. Yes, sir. I will check. <clears throat> Good evening to one and all. I'm Dr. Sanjay. Today, I'm going to present the uh, approach to jaundice. Coming to the case proper, uh, Ms. A is a 70-year-old female with no prior comorbidities, a resident of Coimbatore, a former by occupation, and lower middle class of uh, social economic status, according to modified cooking some scale. She now presented with complaints of chief complaints of jaundice since four months, abdominal distension since one month, bilateral nodal swelling since one month, generalized itching and clay colored stool since one no, month. Slow, 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 please slow down. Please slow down till we, act, till we assimilate what com chief complaints are. Go slow. Jaundice for four months, then. Jaundice for four months, abdominal distension and bilateral nodal swelling since one month, generalized itching and clay colored stool since one month. Don't Complaints, doctor, pale stool and itching and all that. That's all part of the jaundice, no? Oh. Loss of weight and loss of appetite. Uh, coming to the history of present illness, Ms. A is... There are five chief complaints, okay? Yes. All are interrelated. So, yes, can you shortlist the chief complaints? Uh, jaundice since four months, madam. Abdominal distension, bilateral load is swelling. Since That's all. That's, That's all. all. Just hold on to that and now start. Now to the history of presenting illness, Ms. A is a 70-year-old female with no prior comorbidities. She was apparently well four months back when she had high-grade fever associated with chills and productive cough, for which she was evaluated elsewhere and found to have incidental jaundice. CT abdomen and chest was done, which showed polylithiasis and no evidence of any chronic liver disease and bronchitis changes in the lung. Sputum gene export was negative and was managed conservatively and was advised to consult a gastroenterologist, but she was not consulted following which patient was able to carry out all her regular activities. She now presented to a hospital with a chief, <coughs> presented with complaining of LOS discoloration of ice and urine, which is in serious and onset, gradually progressive since I one month. Doctor, one minute. You started off with some fever and some cough with expectoration. That is four months back, madam. Now, and no. Any, no. any relation of that to this present jaundice? No, 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 madam. No, then no why, relation why, at all. Why did you start with that history? That is four months back. Was, I thought she was on ATT. No. What was, was negative? No, nothing was given. What is the link of that history? At, at that time, uh, yes, madam. At that time itself, patient was having jaundice. That is the only link. Fever is not there. I'm just asking you, why did you start with the history of cough and expectoration and gene negative, CT negative? Everything negative. I, I didn't I didn't understand what was happening. Incidentally, jaundice four months back, followed which she was uh, she was fine and she went she was discharged and then since one month she presented with jaundice. First you said four and months. Jaundice. You said jaundice for four months. Yes, well. Now you're saying jaundice for one month. After that, uh, whether the jaundice is there or not, patient was asked to consult a gastroenterologist, but she was able to follow her regular activities. She was fine, so she never consulted a gastroenterologist. But now, what she's telling, she noticed increasing illness discoloration of ice and urine. That is since one month. We are fluctuating jaundice, madam. I... We are not, I have not understood your jaundice history. Okay, Sanjay, what is the total duration of jaundice? Of four months, sir. Four can months. You can you open that email of yours, approach to jaundice? Can you just open that? I can see something on the. Uh, can you see? I am already. I have already. Oh, stop. Sir. Just one second. <laughs> 
Yeah, next slide. Uh, yeah, yeah, fine, fine. Meeting, good, good, good. Yeah. Now you start. Yes, you start. No present. Start. No present. You said, what's your, what's your chief complaint? Madam, jaundice and abdominal distension by a trombus What's the duration? Jaundice since four months and abdominal distension since one month and uh, viral colonial cell since one month. Vitti, just please, uh, because I'm getting irritated. <laughs> Okay, jaundice for abdominal distension one month, bilateral lower limb one month, generalist itching one month, recollect stools one month. I think too many complaints in the chief complaint because chief complaint means chief complaint. No, if you have too many complaints, then you will be putting the entire history in the chief complaint. So tell what the most dominant complaint. Rest of the things, oh, come, for example, clear colored stools and generalist itching all become part of the associated symptom of jaundice. So perhaps we will say jaundice, abdominal distension, and bilateral lower limbs only, and loss of weight and loss of appetite if that is significant. Okay. Okay. Now you, the only doubt was that this lady had some fever with chills and rigor with productive cough, and then at that point of time when she went to the doctor, she was found her incidental jaundice. No, yes, is that yes, what? Okay. Yes, sir. Is that what you wanted to say? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. The patient actually did not complain of jaundice. The jaundice no. was detected by the doctor. Yes, sir. Incidentally, she found her jaundice. So I will at this point just ask you one question. Yes, sir. What sort of illness where the jaundice is detected by somebody other than the patient? Pseudo jaundice. I will tell you two examples. In one of the class, it was described by Professor Narendra Nathan. The jaundice of symptoms and jaundice of signs. The jaundice of symptoms are usually acute parenchymal illnesses. Like in a viral hepatitis, a lot of normal symptoms, jaundice. The jaundice of signs, the symptoms would be very minimal, and but physical signing like jaundice, enlarged liver, gallbladder, all those things are likely to be there in a obstructive jaundice. Okay, so this patient okay. was asymptomatic regarding the digestive tract was concerned and this jaundice was detected incidentally. What are the yes, other sir. situations where the jaundice is detected incidentally? Very latent jaundice when the patient is not having any symptoms. Uh, usually mild type of uh, jaundice, type. especially unconjugated type, which is the most common jaundice in the community. Which affects 7 to 10 percent of the population. Unconjugated type, so hemolytic. Which hemolytic. So uh, hemo yes. that means uh, a large number of people uh, in our uh, country must be having hemolysis. No, that's not correct. Gilbert syndrome. Gilberts. 7 to 10 percent of the people. Apparently, normal people have Gilberts and their Gilberts. jaundice may not be detected at all. Sometimes they detected for the first time by the doctor or tested when they do the LFT for some purpose, they find it. Okay, like that. Or a mild unconjugated <coughs> hemolytic trait also may be uh, presenting like that. Okay, yes. Generally, it is Gilberts and uh, of course, early phase of obstructive jaundice where there is jaundice but not much of uh, symptoms. So Okay, so CT abdomen or whatever it is. Okay, but don't get digress because you are giving uh, giving us a clue from the beginning itself that there is a goldstone and jaundice, etc., etc., etc. So if the chest uh, illness or the pulmonary illness is related to the present problem, according to you, because you have the advantage of examining the patient also, highlight yes. it now. Okay, okay but so if you think it's an incidental observation. <coughs> probably not very much related to uh, the chest findings or chest symptoms, uh, downplay it. Okay. Sir. Okay. Because you are telling it before telling all other symptoms. That means it has to be very important. Okay, because sir. immediately after the presenting, in fact, along with the presenting complaint, you are telling, giving more importance to the uh, chest symptoms like she was found of polylasis and uh, rogiectasis, gene spread was negative, managed conservatively, etc., etc. So those things, unless it is very relevant, please don't give it so important. If you think it's important, you can still mention it, but probably at the fag end of your story. Okay, sir. Okay. Does it anyway become important? It's a respiratory illness with a no, subsequent sir. jaundice. 
uh, I mean, alpha will ninety two percent deficiency may occur with the respiratory illness, but it a is seventy year old patient. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. With the age of the patient is very against. Yes, sir. seventy year old patient presenting for the first time. Do you think it is alpha one ninety two percent deficiency now? No, for sir. No. For the respiratory symptom as well as for the hepatic symptom. No, okay. no, sir. Start no, from the third paragraph. Niti, alpha one anti trypsin deficiency. Yeah. What did he say? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Alpha one anti trypsin deficiency. One, no, yeah. One case is yet to be reported from India. No. The first it case is extremely yet. rare. Second thing, this is not the age. Second, respiratory symptoms should have been there from very early onset. At seventy year, is he present with an acute respiratory illness with the productive cough and subsequent jaundice? Instantly detected. Do not think of alpha one anti trypsin deficiency. Generally, what so, one should consider is that she had a productive cough for which some antibiotic and the most common is this amoxicillin clavulanic acid, which has got a high propensity to produce drug induced liver disease and then they may present with some jaundice. Okay. Second, it may be some sort of a neoplastic process in uh, and and it may be affecting the lung and the liver together, which may be producing both uh, uh, hepatic and respiratory symptoms. Okay, so or it could be something uh, related to both. Okay, okay. Now we will not digress much, but again concentrate on the third paragraph and then continue, yes. please. Uh, she now presented with complaining of below physical rest of eyes, children, insidious and onset, gradually progressive since one month. She also had abdominal distension, which is diffused with frankfulness, followed by low limb swelling, extending to ankles, strip generalized weakness, and easy fatigability is also there. There's a strip loss. Doctor, please describe the jaundice. Just one line, no? Jaundice, insidious onset, progressive, that's all, no? Describe the jaundice. Now, actually, the what you told initially, whether it is gradually increasing severity, whether there is generalized pluritus, along with that, there was pale stools, all those things should come now, one after the other, whether there was any fever, chills, rigor, whether there was any abdominal pain. Okay, all those things should come now. And uh, yes. we, Sanjay, we are a little bit fast and therefore we are not able to sort of uh, understand okay. properly. So it can be a little okay, slow, sir. deliberately okay. make it slow. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, jaundice was associated with history of clay colored stools, a generalized itching of the body, which was worsening as the day progresses, particularly during the evening time. And uh, there is also downward distension, which was diffused. Okay. One minute. After how many days of onset of jaundice did the patient develop pale stool and pruritus? After how many days of jaundice did the patient develop pale stool and yes. uh, with the with, within the same period of time, man, within one period, is one it, month? Is it possible that jaundice, pruritus, everything comes together in a given patient? No, first cholestasis should progress and then. And then only clay colored stools and generalized itching will develop. The other thing can also happen. You can have pale stool first yes. and jaundice can come later. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Please give us a, no, I'm, I, please give us a proper chronological sequence of events. Can you just tell us, highlight the sequence of events in this patient? Uh, Sanjay, the issue is that this patient has jaundice for the last four months. Okay. And you are describing the pruritus, etc., for one month, no? As per your yes. chief complaint, general yes. teaching. So that means after three months after the noticing okay. of the jaundice, only she developed pruritus, no? Yes. This is what yes. ma'am is asking. So there is a gap of three months from the detection yes. of the jaundice to the occurrence of the uh, new symptom like generalized pruritus and pericolous stools. And fairly at the same time, it's also uh, noted that patient has abdominal distension and bilateral lower limb swelling. Yes, yes sir. Down distinction was first and then followed by bilateral load swelling. Is that so? And then there was also history of loss of appetite and significant weight loss of around four kgs, eight kgs since one month. I just is make that... one comment, you know, your chief complaint and history of present illness is just the same, okay? The same sentence you're just repeating. There's no expansion of any of the chief complaint. Every chief complaint you'll have to speak at least for two, three minutes or so to highlight and tell us what you're talking about. Now, loss of appetite and weight has come along with jaundice? No, ma'am. After, after three months of jaundice, oh, then, uh, then only... I, I, I think, I, I don't I, I, One of you, please correct it and put it in an order. You know, we're not, I'm not getting the history right. So, weight loss and loss of appetite is for three months, right? Yes, ma'am. What happened to the jaundice, which came four months back? 
that is that is maybe fluctuating Again, always we have put it one month you know one month yes sir i think whatever you have tried to put initially also should be properly uh, described when you say the history of the present illness okay this is the history of the present illness so it yes. has to be sufficiently detailed but uh, editing out all unwanted detail patients will tell so many additional things we have to edit it you have to edit uh, uh, the story and present yes. okay All right. There was eight kilo weight loss in the last four months, which was undiagnosed. Eight kg. Eight kg. Insignificant weight loss is there. Okay. Eight kg weight loss is there. Okay. We'll go to the next slide. There is no history of fever at present. Fever, cough, evening days temperature, night sweats, abdominal pain. We have to tell. Just let's hold on. Let's hold on. That weight loss and loss of appetite is there. Early satiety is there. Nausea and vomiting. What is the cause of this weight loss, loss of appetite? Jaundice has come on one month now. Earlier you said jaundice for four months. I mean, see when you're giving the history, I should be able to tell that okay, this is the possibility in this patient. Now tell me what is the jaundice four months back? Just highlight that. What is it four months jaundice and what is one month jaundice now? Just clarify that alone. That is sufficient. Four months jaundice was an incidental finding, madam. Patient was not. Uh, patient went for a uh, uh, for fever and uh, fever and product. Why you mention it then? Why you mention it is an incidental finding? And don't mention she went to a gastroenterologist, but she did not go for a follow up, and then she did not come. We're not interested at all in that. As Sir said, do you, you think that jaundice is significant? She's got Gilbert's, is it, or hemolytic anemia? And you said she went back to work. You look at that history, you know. You said she was okay, then she had this, and then she went back to work, and everything was normal. And now she's got jaundice, but there's loss of weight and appetite for four months. On deep is on again asking. Huh? On asking again and again, she told that since four months also See? she gradual weight. Loss. Doctor, patients will tell me. The whole thing no? start with weight loss and anorexia, or did it start with jaundice also? That's the same issue here. <laughs> If she has got weight loss and this thing, and if the jaundice is there for four months back, you know, it's not really fitting in, and then you edit that as doctor. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the the jaundice stands alone four months before, and rest of things are for one month. That will go to that will all go to the so, so jaundice in four the first three months. Three months exactly is one month. Uh, jaundice. That is the issue, okay. because once you say that jaundice was there for four months, we would be interested to know what happened till the onset of additional symptoms. That part of the history is missing, which you told patient was told to have jaundice by the doctor, and patient did not bother to get investigated yes. further. That is a story like that. Yes. That that yes. obviously means that patient was asymptomatic, and probably the jaundice was also mild. He was not much bothered. normally people especially people from our country generally feel feels uh, you know they feel like they have to go to some doctor whether it is uh, ayush or modern medicine with jaundice they don't usually ignore that is what i have observed most of the patients will may, may ignore ordinary other symptoms but jaundice they are all afraid they want to get it treated at least by ayush people they will take some treatment so this is strange that she did not go to any doctor for uh, even after the another doctor telling that she is having jaundice So we will presume that it was a mild jaundice. Yes. Okay. Sir. And she had no whatsoever, no other symptoms uh, until one month ago. Yes, sir. If she had symptoms, she would have definitely gone to. Gone. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, there was no history of fever, cough. Evening days, temperature, night sweats, abdominal pain. There is no history of cam intake, GI bleed in the form of. Uh, Sanjay, why did you bring respiratory symptoms uh, and evening night sweats, etc. at this point? Sir, so because TB producing jaundice in our setting, even in this scenario, tuberculosis. Do you think it is a tuberculosis producing jaundice? Already, she was having four months back some sort of fever. Okay. Yeah. So, what is in your mind? How does uh, tuberculosis produce jaundice? Tuberculosis, TB causing strictures, uh, biliary strictures, or uh, uh, producing jaundice, sir. Bina biliary stricture. Yes. Sir. Okay. Any other any other way in which uh, TB can produce jaundice? Infiltrating the liver. 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 So it is like almost miliary tuberculosis. That's what you are meaning. 
Yes, sir. Patient will be much more sick, you know. What more? What are the rules? Any other can any other way in which a TB can produce jaundice, especially cholestatic jaundice. This yeah. patient has pruritus, no? Any other way? What about intrahepatic? Anything extrahepatically can it produce? Apart from the stricture. <coughs> Involving the bilirubin. Can there be any obstruction due to anything else? To the high level lymph, node, to tubercular lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. Ah, lymph nodes. Lymph okay. nodes. Lymph nodes possible. compressing the bile duct. Okay. Hepatitis. That's one method. Any other method by which TB can be related to jaundice? Stitches. Patient already on treatment. When they can also develop it can be, no? it can be so, you, you should have a clear open mind and then of course obviously there is no history of ATT that will immediately rule it out. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. There but probably no? yeah, uh, general the general rule is that the negative should be pertaining to the case and most likely to related to the differential diagnosis, the first two or three differential diagnosis, which there in my, in your mind and our mind. Okay, and the negative should be related to that, and it okay, and it should not be uh, totally unrelated. Okay, sir. okay, there should be some sort of a relationship with your potential differential diagnosis. We okay, second abdominal, paragraph. We see that abdominal distension in edema, like what happened to that? That abdominal distension and edema, like what happened to that? What was the it is diffuse associated with flank with flank feelings and followed the bilateral load. What is it? Is it generalized NSR or nephrotic? Huh? Nephrotic or hypoproteinemia? What is it you want to convey? Sanjay, no, abdo abdomen? You that when you describe abdominal distension, first you have to say this is a general, the diffuse or generalized abdominal distension. Okay, yes. second thing, it was associated with the bilateral leg okay. yes, Generally, we will expect that this is a, therefore, a systemic water retention or sodium and water retention, whether there is associated diminished urinary output, whether there is any dyspnea, whether there is orthopnea, whether there is any facial puffiness. These all will give us a clue whether it is cardiac, renal, or something else. Okay. So this so much, no and, and then over the one month, uh, was it progressively increasing? Was there any relief with uh, uh, diuretics? Because some people will respond to diuretics very well. Some people do not respond. And according to that, you may also may make some guess regarding the etiology. Okay. So this much things are usually expected when you say about uh, abdominal distension associated with bilateral leg There was no periodical edema, no generalized understanding. It is diffused in the abdomen followed by bilateral load and swelling. That was and how was it progressing? Was it static or progressing? Was there no. any response? To, did she receive any diuretics or anything no. like that? No, sir. She never went to any hospital. She never consulted okay. her doctor. All right. Continue, please. There is no history of complementary alternative medication intake. There is no history of GI bleed in the form of hematemesis, myelina, nausea, vomiting, loose stools, constipation, decreased urine output, cardiorespiratory symptoms, or altered sensorium or altered sleep cycle. There is no history of joint pains, rash, myalgia, oral ulcers, morning sickness, or cold intolerance. What was in your mind when you want, what do you want to rule out by telling joint pains, rash, myalgia, oral ulcers, morning sickness? What do you mean hepatitis, sir? Pardon? Autoimmune hepatitis, sir. Autoimmune hepatitis. You are considering autoimmune hepatitis. Okay. Yes, but you will have to explain why she developed polystasis. If it is a straightforward autoimmune hepatitis, do you expect a polystatic symptoms? Acute stage, it can. Then you will have to bring in additional etiology, no? How do you... It's not that it is not possible. It is possible, still possible. You can actually explain. Suppose you have got overlap. Overlap, PVC overlaps. Yeah, you must then be immediately is... able to tell that. We will keep yes, our job is to keep asking questions. Your yes, job is to give answers. Okay. Sir, we'll keep on asking you questions. Okay, next, tattooing. Tattoo, no history of tattooing, blood transfusions, IV drug abuse, no history of recent travel uh, to an endemic area. Okay, why did you say this? Uh, recent travel, sir. Uh, recent travel and prodromal symptoms. Why? You should not. Uh, you should not put in uh, everything just because uh, it's. Because, uh, yeah. You are because going. This to is something which you are. You are. Parangema, liver damage, like hepatitis, no? 
what the history will correlate with something going on with the travel and four months history of jaundice. It does not correlate. So you should not just give, just because there's one, uh, one list of things you need to talk. Okay, you need to tell whether this is relevant to the case or not. Okay, so that means you were thinking of viral hepatitis, which is probably right. not very relevant here. Yeah. Because so, uh, the recent yeah. travel and all those things are more likely for an infective type uh, hepatitis, either hepatitis uh, A or E, and it doesn't look like that, no? Because there is no prodrome, insidious onset, etc. The next slide. Uh, no, it's of diminished vision, bone pain. Okay, why, why, why are you telling, or why, why did you mention all these things, like diminished vision, bone so, pain, easy bruisability, paresthesia, peripheral neuropathy, etc. Why did you mention these? Polystatic uh, jaundice is there, sir. Fat solubility for one month. She has symptom only for one month. Do you expect all these things to happen in one month? These are the features of classic uh, chronic cholestasis. No, chronic cholestasis uh, with uh, uh, diminished absorption of uh, uh, vitamin A, producing diminished absorption, vitamin other vitamin, vitamin D, then vitamin K, and other vitamin. That is what you are mentioning. Okay, this all happens uh, uh, not immediately. Within a month and all, it is very unlikely. There will be sufficient store of these fat soluble vitamins. Okay. Except perhaps K, most of the other vitamins they have store, good store. So, uh, once again, we would like to tell you that this is your uh, probably one of the first presentation. The negatives must be very relevant to the case. Very relevant. Uh, the clue to say the negative is to think of the first three differential diagnosis and if there are uh, the first the first diagnosis will have the maximum positive history and the things which you want to eliminate are the ones which are you're going to say no 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 or things which are related to the first case first diagnosis okay then things you want to eliminate and it should be very uh, sort of reasonable negative you cannot bring in all the possible negatives when you describe a history and mention it because invariably the examiner will catch you. They will catch you and start asking and totally in a different direction they will go. And you may not be even able to present the case on time. Okay. So, okay, continue please. Next slide. Coming to the past history, there is no previous history of jaundice or similar complaints in the past. There is no history of uh, there is a history of surgery for lump of the month 30 years back. Documents were not available. Uh, there is no history of diabetes, hypertension, bronchial asthma, tuberculosis, CVA, CAD, chronic kidney disease, or any chronic medication intake. She's a post comorbidities right in your first statement. Your first statement was, which itself is wrong. Your first statement said, patient with no comorbid. The first statement, the very first, as you started the history, you said, took whatever is the age of the patient with no comorbidity. I, I think uh, we have to polish the history a bit before. I don't think we should really go in for all this, you know, just see. Uh, okay, uh, let us see how you I think it is his get. first presentation, ma'am. That may be. Uh, no, that's okay. okay. What I'm saying is let's mold him to that type of presentation. No, I think that's important. Okay, let's continue. Yeah, this, you already uh, told no comorbidities. Don't again keep on repeating. And it has a, a, a very, big, a very exhaustive be, list, you know. It can't be a very. That's another thing. Yeah. We could have finished off by saying no significant comorbidity, like like important ones, and finish off in one breath. Okay. One line. Yeah. She's a postmenopausal woman, consumes mixed diet. Uh, pre illness, she was able to take about 2000 kilocalories per day. Since last one month, she's taking around 1500 kilocalories per day. Again, there's, there's, a, there's a discordant here. You, you have said that she has got a significant weight loss. Okay. And uh, I don't think anybody consuming 1,500 kilocalories will have so much of significant weight loss. So this is again discordant. So be careful on this. If you're not, just don't try to put some numbers. Okay. This, how old is she? 75. 70. 70. 70. And 2,000 kilocalories is a big man amount. Right? They won't be able to take it. So be very correct about these things. Then the examiner will think that you're cooked up. Somebody is having a fairly 1,500 kilocalories, you think... Uh, they lose so much of weight. Again, yeah, 70 will be, she will be mostly sedentary and not uh, uh, any activity. And 1,500 will be enough for her. Because for a sedentary person, 1,800 is okay, no? Yes. Okay. 
there were no okay, additions let's, let's move on uh, come to the summary sir there was uh, here is a summary no, 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 discuss no, i don't want the summary now you just tell are we dealing with what type of jaundice are we dealing with can you just In that, what type of jaundice polystatic jaundice madam why do you say it's polystatic because patient is having <coughs> polystatic symptoms like uh, itching and clay colored stools there is associated high colored urine is also there that is the jaundice no any jaundice will have high colored urine no we are we are not disagreement regarding the jaundice part of it so say it was a jaundice jaundice for the past four months and polystatic symptoms for the past uh, one month one month with weight loss and loss of appetite and abdominal distress bilateral no, 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 hurry or the same jaundice now just tell us is it intrahepatic or extrahepatic i'd like to consider extrahepatic jaundice madam for what reason why do you say it's extrahepatic because the age of the patient is 70 years and is a painless jaundice and is a progressive jaundice associated with cholestasis so there might be an obstruction it's a, it's a painless jaundice so you would like to consider extrahepatic extrahepatic it's a extrahepatic painless condition you are you have in your mind so, uh, see head of pancreas फर्स्ट So number two is a periamblary carcinoma because it's a painless uh, jaundice, and then it's it was fluctuating maybe, and then uh, the third differential being. Uh, okay, what was your explanation for uh, not having any fluctuating jaundice? Yeah, fluctuating. You never mentioned anything. Four months back, she was having jaundice, but uh, there is significant or uh, and then she presented with one month. So in between, what happened? We really don't know, madam. That's why. No, I, we do not know. No, patient will know. It's not that you or I know. Patient. The patient uh, was complaining of jaundice only for one month. No, it was incidental. Okay. Uh, if you are considering extra hepatic obstruction uh, jaundice because she has got a painless jaundice, she has years recent jaundice, cholestasis, and cholestasis and. And weight loss anorexia, but of course there is an abnormal distribution. You need to, if you are considering that, you need to go by which are the most common causes statistically, which is more common. So, carcinoma head of pancreas is one. Very ample carcinoma fluctuation is uh, set, but we don't hardly see in our clinical practice. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. if it is a short history, what is the other thing? What is the other cause? Malignancy. Well, स्टिकल वे Which is the yeah. most common? Now she has got abdominal distension. So what are the possibilities of abdominal? Yeah, one. Maybe okay. Just one second. Now can it be intrahepatic polystatic? Yeah. Any differentials by intrahepatic? Have to sell a carcinoma. In in view of recent abdominal distension, bilateral no, no. distension, I also no no. Start from jaundice and then uh, from the jaundice part, you then uh, uh, other things will come later. From what this jaundice, can this be intrahepatic polystasis? Will you consider intrahepatic cholestasis? Yes, 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 madam. I'll I'll consider intrahepatic cholestasis uh, being uh, in view of ascites and bilateral organ swelling, decompensated chronic liver disease. Uh, Maybe a possibility uh, considering uh, possible secondary to chronic viral hepatitis, secondary to viral hepatitis, viral infection. If it is a pharyngeal liver disease, how do you explain the cholestatic uh, symptoms? <laughs> etiology may be secondary to autoimmune or uh, uh, hepatitis b acute viral hepatitis chronic reactivation of acute viral hepatitis causing cholestasis no no chronic acute intrahepatic cholestasis in a patient who has developed abdominal distension and progressive jaundice you need to say that you are considering intrahepatic cholestasis also 
in this setting and your diagnosis will be there will be an underlying chronic parenchymal disease which has decompensated. So you need to say what are the what will be the causes of chronic parenchymal liver disease in this age group, 70 years one, it could be viral. Viral. Second, autoimmune may be a possibility. I mean, extreme and how does how does chronic parenchymal liver disease suddenly will come uh, with the with the jaundice and ascites? What will be the mechanisms? So what do you call that? By what do you call that? A chronic parenchymal liver disease patient presenting with ascites and fetal edema. What is that syndrome? Can, can acute but carry syndrome can be a possibility. Acute no, it is a decompensation. No, straightforward. We are not talking. We are saying a decompensation. Decompensation. So when how can so suddenly is... somebody who has got a chronic can suddenly decompensate? What are the ways they can decompensate? Why do they decompensate? Some acute viral illness, acute viral hepatitis may, uh, may progress into decompensation. Acute large... viral illness. Now, here is 70 year old patient has come with with anorexia and weight weight loss in a setting of a chronic parenchymal liver disease. Somebody decompensates with. Anorexia and weight loss. What is the part of this? Large HCC compressing the large hepatocellular carcinoma. Large hepatocellular carcinoma compressing the large. Why should you say large? Then you then they'll ask you what is large. One, it could be hepatocellular carcinoma. Number two, number two, cholangiocarcinoma. That's what Madam is asking. Can it be intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? Intrahepatic. Intrahepatic. What always you can explain the ascites and fetal edema if there is ascites. In the, in the scenario which you just described, a parenchymal liver disease in the background, recently decompensated, there is an underlying hepatocellular carcinoma. Because of the portulone thrombus. Yeah. The HCC causing portulone thrombus. Is it portal vein thrombus or some other vein thrombus? Hepatic vein thrombus and IVC? No. Yeah, yes, sir. I mean, IV, HCC is, is, compression. HCC, is, 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 uh, can HCC produce an increased risk for uh, hepatic vein thrombosis and IVC obstruction? Yes, sir. HCC, large HCC compression, IVC causes second. You, you don't have to be large at all. That's another thing. Uh, yes. Wait, don't say large don't small. think that it is yes. the volume of the HCC. No. It is not. Compression, okay. IVC. So an HCC can produce decompensation and in a short period of time, anorexia, weight loss. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Can any other malignancy produce uh, jaundice and anorexia, weight loss, etc., etc.? You already mentioned carcinoma, head of pancreas. You have mentioned periambulary. You have mentioned uh, cholangiocarcinoma. Now we have mentioned hepatocellular carcinoma. I am asking you any other. GB carcinoma, GB malignancy. GB malignancy we consider, but you said it's very unlikely in South India. And generally, pain is, will be one of the significant symptoms also. GB. Metastatic lymph nodes. Can some other malignancy in the upper GIT can present with obstructive jaundice? Can CS stomach present with object, obstructive CS jaundice? CS stomach with liver metastasis and uh, peripotent lymph nodes. Compressing lymph the, nodes. Lymph uh, nodes. Lymph uh, probably lymph that's the way. But I would like to stress that generally, when you are when you are asked to say generally, a, a person with extra hepatic biliary obstruction, either in the lumen or outside, generally tend to have pain. Okay, if there is pain along with cholestatic jaundice, we generally think it is extra hepatic because there will have to be either a malignancy or a, a calculate. Intrahepatic cholestasis by and large is biochemical cholestasis generally due to either an inflammation or a bland cholestasis and usually pain is absent. Of course, there are mechanical obstruction like sclerosing cholangitis and other conditions where there is a focal multiple areas of obstruction or a cholangiopathy, etc. But most of these conditions, there may not be any pain at all. So generally, intrahepatic is generally painless. Extrahepatic generally painful if the pain is considered as a dominant symptom. There can be exceptions where, for example, periambule, there may not be any pain. A small, strategically located CA head of pancreas may not produce any pain. Okay. And cholangiocarcinoma may not produce any pain, especially in the first uh, few months of the illness. So, exceptions are there. But generally, painless for intrahepatic and painful for extrahepatic. That's the general dictum. Second thing, you look at additional features. This patient has a, a evidence of a probably a decompensation. 
Okay, so bring it to other. So, if you do you think this is uh, CA adopt angrias with the decompensation? CA periambular region with the decompensation? Cholangiocarcinoma with the decompensation? Is it a usual picture? Very rare, sir. CA adopt pancreas causing. Yeah, we have seen many cases of obstructive joint disease malignancy. The progression is fast, but presentation with decompensation and all is unusual. Very unusual. So I think we may have to bring in other causes for the abdominal distension and pyrrole edema. We can ask the other two persons also. Do we have a list of differential diagnosis, Dr. Sanjay? Can it be, uh, can it be uh, the, just hypoproteinemia? What, what is the response to diuretics? What is the urine output? All that you'd have to mention, no? There is no history of polyuria, madam. Polyuria? You're asking of no. polyuria? No decrease urine output. Uh, if it's not a decreased urine output, does the patient have a liver disease? What is the response to the diuretics? She never went to any hospital. She never took the. Diuretics. He did not go to a doctor, and uh, therefore did not receive diuretic. That I think he answered so earlier. Is it a liver disease at all? No, but, she, but this lady takes one thousand kilo, thousand five hundred kilocalories even now. No, so yes, we cannot expect any nutritional problem at the moment. Can we call on uh, uh, other two discussion? Dr. Ritwik? Are you there? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Can you discuss the case? Can you just tell us uh, uh, what are the likely differential diagnosis? Uh, so with this uh, background of uh, cholestatic jaundice predominantly with uh, underlying uh, possible uh, parenchymal liver disease, uh, I would still consider uh, it as a uh, uh, either HCC or a cholangiocarcinoma as my top differential diagnosis. So it could be other malignancies like a periampillary or a, a carcinoma of, uh, of a head of pancreas with a, a, a severe malnutrition and uh, causing ascites. And uh, uh, yes, sir. How do you explain the malnutrition which occurred within one month of the onset of cholestasis? Uh, Yes, so that uh, that is a short duration for uh, um, for the ascites to develop. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, if it is malign, if it is a undernutrition, she has to develop profound hypoalbuminemia, and she even now it takes one thousand five hundred kilocalories. No, that is yes, that in such situations unlikely. Doctor Snehal. Yes, sir. Do you have any uh, different? List yes, of differential yeah. diagnosis. So, so, based on the history, sir, uh, sir, I would try like to think about uh, intrahepatic causes like uh, decompensated liver disease, uh, secondary to uh, viral etiology as my uh, first diagnosis. Sir. How do you explain the cholestasis then? Progressive cholestasis. Doctor Sneha, how on what basis do you say that she's got a chronic liver disease? Cirrhosis. She's got cirrhosis for hypertension, right? On what basis do we say this with this history? So, uh, Ma'am, uh, based, uh, she's having uh, abdominal distension and uh, bilateral pedal edema. Uh, so no, no your that answer should be she's 70 years. She has had a job. So let's, let's say there is no EHB, there's no extra hepatic biliary obstruction. No diuretics. Somebody has to, uh, you need to say, you need to say that somebody had jaundice, progressive jaundice, had cholestasis, and now she has got ascites. If somebody has got a jaundice and he has to decompensate, uh, decompensate in one month's time, what do you, what are you thinking of? Is it an acute hepatitis, or you think there is a underlying chronic liver disease? Sir, uh, sir, decompensation probably due to uh, HCC or... Uh... No, no, I'm not. I'm asking you a very question. The patient has got one month history of jaundice, progressive. She's got itching. Then she developed uh, pedal edema and abdominal distension. In a setting of your our thinking in of intrahepatic polystatic jaundice or something, somebody decompensates within one month. 
you think any acute hepatitis will decompensate in one month? Uh, yes, sir. There is if, a, if a chronic liver disease is uh, developed... Oh, there should, you should think of that there is an underlying chronic liver disease already. Yes, sir. There is some other trigger which has produced jaundice and decompensation. So yes, she has got an underlying chronic liver disease. She might have an underlying cirrhosis. That could be of many any other cause. It could be hep B at 70 years. What do you think? Hep B or hep C? Hepatitis B. Hepatitis C. 70 years, predominantly hepatitis C. C in more than this is hepatitis C people are the one who decomposite much later. Hepatitis B, we always think about it. It could be a reactivation. Yeah, it could yeah, be yeah. an underlying chronic hep B with cirrhosis, already pre existing cirrhosis, and a sudden flare has, flare. has decomposited. Yeah. Or it could be a hepatitis C with some other trigger. It could be a viral trigger, virus, a hepatitis C cirrhotic. Viral trigger. The viral trigger could be hepatitis A, E, B. Okay. Or there should be some other complications like a HCC or something. So you need to really think that, hepatitis uh, A or E. Sneha. Liver mets. Liver mets don't come with ascites. Okay. Yes, sir. Liver mets. Yeah, liver mets are presenting with ascites. ascites. It's they don't come with ascites. So you need to think that, I would think that she's got an underlying chronic parenchymal liver disease and start an answer because she has decompensated in one month's time. In, in one month's time. So this de the, you need to say what are, the cause, what are the cause of chronic liver disease at 70 years of age? 70 years of age, what will be the in a female? What are the possibilities? Of, what are the etiology of chronic liver disease? That could be hep B, it could be hep C, it could be NASH, it could be a burnt out autoimmune disease. Okay, or she may have and always consider a vascular etiology. In a liver disease in your different shall we look at the physical finding sanjay coming to the general examination we should like that because then we need to really we need to really why is she decompensating why is she got decompensated why then what are the cause of sudden onset decompensation it could be Thank you, but uh, it could be due to uh, reactivation of B. It could be some superimposed hepatitis A, E or drug on a previous existing liver disease. It could be either a malignancy like hepatocellular carcinoma or it could be some well, sudden on, acute on a chronic blood carrier. You can't say acute blood carrier. No acute blood carrier will suddenly come with, uh, with so much of... Uh, they may come with ascites, but a lady who has been having jaundice for one month, you can't put acute butt carry as a, as a as a syndrome. So it could be an acute on a chronic butt carry. This will be the thing. But in a setting like this, if you are thinking of things, you, should, you need to think like this. No person with acute hepatitis will decompensate in one month's time. In one month's time. If there are certain times drug-induced liver injury, which can after four weeks start decompensating because... Nowadays, we don't use a terminology called subacute hepatic failure. We have seen in certain drugs where it comes as cholestasis and after four to six weeks, they start developing ascites. That is okay. extra hepatic biliary obstruction. If it is an extra hepatic biliary obstruction, why there is an abdominal disease? This is what I think you should discuss in this way. If you think it is extra hepatic biliary obstruction, and these are your uh, statistically discussed from my head of pancreas, periamplary, cholangio, and GB malignancy. You need to say what are the cause of ascites. The cause of ascites could be metastatic to the peritoneum or it could be a secondary biliary cirrhosis. If it is metastatic to the peritoneum, which are the malignancies which do he, among these four will metastatic to peri peritoneum? One, it will be pan pan pancreas. Periamplary does not usually metastatize so much. Cholangio CA and and probably uh, carcinoma G. So this is how you completely go through this. So you we should you shouldn't let the examiner ask. Do you think it will be intrahepatic cholestasis? You should say that I'll keep it lower or not. But this is my first diagnosis because of this. But I'll also consider uh, an intrahepatic cholestasis also because of the following points. And I consider that there is an underlying chronic parenchymal liver disease. This is the etiology. And what are the what are the complicated what complications?
reactions have occurred to produce sudden onset of ascites or one as a decomposition so fast. This is how you do really completely split the your uh, discussion. Anything else, Bhagis, sir? I think we uh, because uh, we are running short of time. Yeah. We will we will look at the physical findings and available investigation and then proceed to his presentation. Okay. So in the general physical examination, what we got was uh, pallor and interest and rate to beating type of equipment. No and scratch marks. I'll just make one comment in your slides and all. Don't have all these things by the side. Okay. That should be just a black and white slide. Font size will be 40. The text slide will be 32. We don't want any any of these unnecessary. Unnecessary graphics should be completely avoided. Totally avoided. Uh, nutritional assessment, she is poorly built and poorly nourished. Uh, body weight of 40 kgs and height of 165 centimeters with a BMI, corrected BMI 14.7 kg per meter. Yeah, this, is, this is where you make, see, you are saying body weight 40, height 165, BMI is 14.7 and you said she was consuming 1500 kilocalories. Exactly. This disconnect, should not, yeah. uh, this disconnect should not happen. Do you expect somebody? I take 1600 every day. You think I am poorly nourished? No. So this disconnect should not happen. You should use your mind properly. Okay. okay. They should everybody accommodate. You disconnect uh, one finding, you come and clear this is not. Right. And the other thing is don't say no evidence of fact of water soluble vitamin deficiency or micronutrient deficiency. These are not what are you looking for? What are you looking for? This is not the way. Okay, is there a of thalmeria? Is there a this? Is there a bony any bony tenderness? Does he have any ecchymosis? All this thing you should say. If you say that, we will not ask you the question. You say, what is the evidence of fat and Some Some will ask you, let me know. Then they will ask you, what is the metabolism of vitamin K? Okay. Peacock status of one and uh, coming to the system examination. Uh, what are the things that you look for, doctor, in physical examination this patient who suspected malignancy? Science. So, General examination, you should actually certain very important negatives, no? Because no. you are considering malignancy. What are those? Acanthosis migraines has an excellent marker of malignancy, migratory thrombophilbitis, pulsi uh, in the pancreas, and then um, uh, signs of uh, lesser relax for colon cord so, so Lesser Ado relax and all is for upper GI doctor. Just we're not asking you the complete list of all the things that we're asking for. In this patient who suspected extra palliability obstruction, what are the important things that you would look for in general physical examination? Which are the lymph nodes you look for? Uh, Supraclavicular lymph node, I will see, madam, and uh, very umbilical nodes, I will see. So this is the main lymph nodes. Supraclavicular and very umbilical. Virtuous node and systematic loss of nodules. What? what? What are, the, what are the signs you look for in a female for chronic liver disease? You said no signs of chronic liver disease. What all did you look for? Uh, is, is there any alopecia, parotid enlargement, and then not, not, parotid, parotid enlargement? Parotid enlargement. Parotid enlargement, alopecia, loss of axillary hair. Is there any? Uh, nothing, doctor. Nothing in a female. Okay, please don't make such mistakes. All these things are not seen in a female. Okay, we will continue on physical examination. Scar plus uh, flying dull. Deep palpation. Something he said there was a significant issue of a lump being removed some time back. That summary. Yeah. 30 years, back, 30 years back, she had some lump abdomen surgery, madam. Longitudinal heel scar was there in the uh, paraclet. Lump where? Lower abdomen, madam. Lower abdomen. Lower abdomen. There is an infra umbilical paraclet region when scar is there. But not related. To me. Don't know, no. 30 years back, she's 40 years old, no? Yes, ma'am. I don't know. The history is, I think we have to mold them towards a good history taking. I am in examination. I'm not interested. History is just, just too bad. I think also a palpable left lobe we must avoid because uh, then the question will come up to which part 
up to which line is left low, up to which line is right low, we will be asked about surface marking, etc. What you have to say, liver palpable below the right surface margin or in the epigastric region, whatever it is, how many centimeters in the mid lane or how many centimeters in the right nostril. Right, mid clavicular and, line. And also don't say splenomegaly and all, just put it simple. Spleen not palpable, trough spleen resonant or dull, that's all. Don't Except. use the word splenomegaly. Uh, in, in percussion, your span is 12 centimeters. Shifted dullness is present. Top space percussion is tympanic. And auscultation, bubble sounds were normal. There is no P or no venous hum. What about the shifting dullness? Shifting dullness, fluid. What it's happens fine. to the shifting dullness? Shifting dullness is there, madam. How much? What is the amount of fluid? Gro moderate ascites is there. With flank fullness. What if this patient tells your patient has got portal hypertension? Ascites is there. Huh? Ascites is there. Ascites is sufficient to tell patients has got portal hypertension. There should be, be splenomegaly also. Not. What I is thought the, what spleen is the is clinical not indicator for a splenomegaly, uh, for the portal hypertension? The clinical indicator. Ascites is Then, what is the clinical indicator? Splenomegaly. Splenomegaly. You're not able to play, be able to palpate the spleen here. So, what could be the possibilities? The spleen was not palpable. Trough space was also resonant, no? No splenomegaly is there. Shall we proceed? Yes. Okay, now, uh, Dr. San Dr. Ritwik. VT, what I think hmm. is since the, the, the whole se session is only an approach to jaundice, let's discuss it as an oral presentation and then there's no need for slide. Could then let us, each of us, just push in and tell them how to approach a jaundice, you know? I think okay. we can just do the investigation because I've not got the history, we've not got the history right. So... We are going to depend on the lab's findings, the history, the examination clinical findings are also the same. So in a given patient with jaundice, let us just go through the approach. Just tell you, if you have some slides, we don't want bilirubin metabolism and all. Just tell us the approach to jaundice. Just take up that discussion. Now. Can we complete this case and try to know what it is actually? I don't know. Okay, quickly do it. Finish it, yeah. Okay. Ritwik. Yeah. Yes, sir. Just interpret the abnormal findings. The uh, LFT, concentrate on the LFT. Yes, sir. Uh, the platelet count is uh, 1 50 and the SR is mildly elevated. The LFT shows a, a total bilirubin of uh, 15 and a direct. 15 of 10. Yeah, significant. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, significant. And uh, there's also uh, uh, AST more than ALT, like 500 and 290. And uh, there's ALP elevation and a mild GGT uh, elevation with a uh, hypoalbumia and. Uh, AG reversal, globulin is 5.5. Uh, other labs look uh, fairly, uh, yes, sir. No. So, it's so a mild uh, hypokalemia. Hypokalemia is present. Okay, fine. Uh, here, uh, uh, this uh, vitamin D on the high uh, deficient side. I think at the, this point, uh, when you are asking the examination, I think we will not mention these things because, again, a uh, lot of unwanted questions will come. Uh, yes, the last three uh, may be uh, mentioned, but yes, rest of the yes. things, uh, uh, urine sports sodium, okay, but uh, urine PCR, okay, blood and urine culture, because there is no obvious fever or anything, probably will not mention. CA99. Yes, CA99 seems to be elevated at 167, and uh, other tumor, AFP and CEA is normal. So what next? What do you think from this LFT? So it is a. Uh, uh, so it looks like uh, an obstructive uh, uh, cholestatic jaundice with. Uh, SG40. SG40 is 570 to SG290. It's a more of a hepat, uh, hepatic cellular with a mixed uh, jaundice of uh, ALP elevation is there. So there is some amount of cholestasis uh, 
uh, as well. And also there's a, a AJ River still, so it could be a, a, a CLD. Uh, there could be a your comment on globulins. Yes, sir. The global is this reverse and or is the globulin is normal hyper, or more? Hyper there's increase in the globulin level, so we could consider as uh, an autoimmune component uh, uh, as well in this. So this LFT shows conjugate hyperbilirubinemia, significant elevation of uh, transaminases, uh, and some degree of elevation of alkaline phosphate GGT, hypoalbuminemia, and hyperglobulinemia. So with this, what will be your diagnosis with this LFT? So the, uh, uh, with the tumor markers being elevated, it could be a primary. No, I am asking ML. with this LFT. With this LFT, we will look at tumor markers later. Yes, sir. Uh, with this LFT, my uh, would be a parenchymal liver disease with the uh, evidence of cholestasis uh, uh, due to some obstruction. There's a. Is it an acute or chronic parenchymal liver disease? It looks like a chronic parenchymal liver disease, sir. With, uh, and then how do you explain the significant elevation of transaminases? I think there's a background chronic liver disease with probably an acute insult. Acute which will explain insult. the bilirubin elevation as well as the transaminase elevation with a cholestatic component. The elevated globulin also need to be considered important because if the globulin is important, this, can you just tell us why it could be? What, what cause it could be? Uh, so the is this an autoimmune uh, or a um, is it part of the uh, chronic parenchymal liver disease itself? Uh, okay, uh, so we will consider autoimmune liver disease. Or simple straightforward autoimmune liver disease, or a little bit uh, different. How do you explain the cholestatic symptoms and elevation alkaline phosphatase? And autoimmune hepatitis. Otherwise, in autoimmune hepatitis, when do you get cholestasis? With a component of uh, uh, PBC uh, overlap. 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 overlap symptoms. It can be autoimmune cholangiopathy. Or there may be an overlap of PBC, PSC. Okay. We should name it could be an overlap syndrome. For such situation, once I do you really say, think this is an autoimmune liver disease? So, 70 years uh, coming with one month job. For the first time, yes, it's sir, autoimmune first time disease. Time Very rare okay. at that age. I, I do agree there's a bimodal presentation of autoimmune hepatitis. You can be for surprises, but okay. Where else can you get? Uh, can globulins go up in malignancies? Yes, sir. That is uh, a possibility, sir. Malignant. Can it go up in uh, granulomatous disease? Infiltrative, yes, sir. Sar sarcoidosis. Yeah, all those things. Yes, sir. Tuberculosis. Okay. Tuberculosis. It can go up. I'm not talking tuber in this case, but these are things where can, globulins can go up. Can it just go up in uh, patients with uh, cirrhosis? De novo? Yes, De novo in cirrhotics. Yeah. Is there only a IG reversal or is there a hyperglobulinemia in cirrhosis? So, uh, both, both will be there, sir. Uh, hyperglobulinemia will also be there, sir. Okay. Okay. Please look at this. Chronic liver disease work, uh, viral serology, HBCG, and HCV, HIV, HEV, and, and HEV were negative. ANA profile and liver IgG profile were negative. ANA IF is positive, 1 is to 100. Serum IgG levels were 39, more than uh, two times elevated. Uh, FLP was uh, uh, for serum cholesterol, triglycerides, everything was low. PSA was normal. Anti TP was elevated, 338. Do you want to comment on this, uh, Dr. Ritwik? Ritwik, comment on this. Uh, so the autoimmune profile is uh, negative. Uh, the AMA uh, and uh, 
IgG also is negative, uh, that, but serum IgG levels were uh, elevated uh, with the ANA of 3 plus. So still there is a possibility of uh, uh, the autoimmune uh, hepatitis being uh, a positive. ANA, IF positive, cytoplasm, so reticulate, 3 plus. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, it might be a non-specific finding, but... Uh, Serum IgG? Does it satisfy the criteria for autoimmune disease? Sneha. <laughs> The lossless light, I will, I will show it. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. That's a temporary outage. That's why the slides are not seen. Okay, let us proceed. Acetic fluid shows high sac. High sac liquid in ADA is normal. Acetic fluid culture was sterile. Cytology showed. Inflammation is there. Then you proceed with the ultrasound abdomen, uh, uh, of course, the codex of the liver with sacrosanic plate is there. There is no focal lesion or ISBRD. Portal lesion is normal. Uh, multiple collaterals are there. Uh, borderline splenomegaly and then uh, myelocytis was there. Top plate doesn't show any portal thrombus. So basically, liver is coarse and decor structure with the surface irregularity. Portal vein is mildly dilated. Cholelithiasis. And dilated portal vein with periportal collateral. So, suggestion of a chronic pyrangamal liver disease. No viruses. No viruses. Then we proceeded with a triple phase CCT abdomen. Uh, it showed lobulated and irregular surface of the liver. Uh, right lobe is smaller, collet lobe and left lobe were enlarged. Nitrogenous enhanced split of liver was there. There was no significant focal lesion. Hepatic means IBC were thin and caliber. Uh, mild dilated portal vein is there, no portal vein thrombus. Multiple collaterals are there. CBD is normal, no CBD calculus. Few nodes are there, insignificant nodes. Okay, so what does this show? The arterial, this is the arterial phase, in the delayed phase, uh, venous phase, uh, there is only a heterogeneous enhancement, there is no arterial uh, enhancement. This. This washout was not there. Go back, please. So, what was uh, here? Uh, she had a chronic liver disease, but uh, what was really. Uh, Sorry, sir, I got logged out. I just uh, came back. Yeah, there's no obvious mass, but there is a mild. Uh, IH, uh, central IHBR was a little prominent. Yes, as per this. And, uh, one, one, and your CA9, uh, CA9 was 167. Yes, sir. Your central IHBR tree, your radicals were mildly prominent. Visualize common hepatic is also mildly prominent. So, in the prominence of that, uh, considering uh, possible cholangiocarcinoma, we proceeded no, with Because that. that central IHBR was the, so what do you do next? Where did you consider an MRI? So, it is a 3D and we'll get a better picture of the uh, uh, biliary, biliary tract. So, we proceeded with an MRI abdomen. 
concentrating ice BRD and uh, CHD prominence. In MR abdomen, there is a poorly defined area of T2 hyperintensity involved in segment 6 and 7 with the retraction of the adjacent capsule. After ideal contrast administration, there is progressive enhancement is there. What There's is this capsular retraction? Yeah. Do the capsular retraction. If the tumor is adjacent to the capsule, then uh, the uh, capsule will, will want to get retracted. Do the capsule retraction. You can see a nice capsule retraction. There in the segment six and segment seven, we can see the clearly capsular retraction is there. Okay, so finally. So, the final diagnosis is a 70 year old female uh, has decompensated chronic uh, cirrhosis of liver, possible autoimmune hepatitis, and simplified autoimmune score of 6, and CTPC uh, with a mild score of 27 with portal hypertension and high SAG low protein ascites, and uh, MR showing uh, intrahepatic cholangial carcinoma, mass forming in segment 6 and 7. So this is a background uh, chronic liver disease uh, with the recent decompensation and the cause of decompensation seems to be due to the development of underlying neoplasm, most likely intrahepatic phalangeal carcinoma. Yes, sir. Why is it not a HCC? Because there is no arterial enhancement, there is no venous washout. Classical picture of the HCC is not there. Uh, there is heterogeneous enhancement is there in MR. There is T2 hyper intensity is there both in the uh, generally there is intrahepatic, both arterial and venous phase enhancement should be there. The capsular retraction is again the more and in uh, clinching the intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma with capsular retraction. PT, sir. And uh, Sanjay, do you have a slide showing? Yes, sir. I've sent you, sir. This is the one which I have been showing, no? Oh, I said the other set of slides also I've sent you, sir. You see whether we can share it. I will just check. Or we can read it out. I can start, sir. Yeah, the second one. Okay, I got it. Just give me a few seconds. How often does intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma present as obstructive jaundice? Very rare, madam. Intra it is intrahepatic or involving the We just want to know what percentage. What is how how does intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma present as polystatic jaundice? It's after the secondary biliary radicals. So. Uh, hmm? It involves generally mass forming lesion is after the secondary biliary radicals. So, do you think that, that small mass there is causing the obstructive jaundice, polystatic pain stools, and all that? Chance is the terminal, terminal uh, part, uh, stage of cholangeal carcinoma, with, even if it is intrahepatic, can progress to jaundice in the side. Uh, with the side, loss of pain, jaundice, abdominal distinction can progress. Terminal stage of intrahepatic is. The exam, please don't mention intrahepatic cholangeal carcinoma. Okay. And there's nothing in the history to tell she's got a chronic liver disease. Nothing in the history. Sanjay, you can read out uh, your presentation. I have some technical problems. I will just uh, try to upload it. Meanwhile, you just start. We have, we have to do. Oh. Ma'am, shall we do it? Now it's uh, 9.23. That's what I'm saying. Let's not go through the slides. You know, you start with a little bit metabolism. And I think we can, uh, uh, some of us uh, can tell them important points in a patient with the jaundice. Professor Venkat. Yes, sir. 
Yeah, yes, sir. Can yeah, you just uh, uh, yeah. tell them the important points yes. when you deal with the case of approach. jaundice? Approach, just the approach. So when uh, somebody comes with jaundice, I think we look at the age of the patient and also look at if they are coming with a prodrome symptoms and uh, how is the jaundice progressive and does they have cholestatic symptoms and if these are cholestatic symptoms uh, what are the associated uh, is it pruritus and clay colored stools or only one of these things and uh, basically then any associated anorexia weight loss anorexia, weight loss are there. And uh, that is if somebody is very old, say around 70 year old lady, this lady comes with a one month history of jaundice and with a significant weight loss anorexia, I would rather think of malignancy as a first choice. If a young man comes or young lady comes with jaundice, with prodromal symptoms uh, and uh, any history of uh, CAM or any drug intake, so I think this will, will, will be something like what you think of. It could be a viral hepatitis drug or autoimmune hepatitis drug. And if somebody comes with jaundice and you find that the patient is developing, if it's a progressive ascites over a period of time, then you will think of an underlying chronic parenchymal lung disease. But if somebody has suddenly has to, you should also consider a chronic parenchymal lung disease when somebody has got a jaundice and onset of ascites uh, very quickly, if you suppose they, they have ascites in two, three weeks to four weeks, I would think that the patient has got an underlying chronic parenchymal And uh, if the patient comes without any progressive abnormal but elderly patient who comes with cholestatic symptoms and jaundice, we would rather think of uh, probably an extra hepatic biliary obstruction as a first step. In your examination, uh, if it is going to be an acute hepatitis, you won't get much except for a small soft tender liver. But in examination, you should find out are there any causes of any extra hepatic biliary obstruction if it's an old patient. And you, the most important clinical examination is you look for nodes, you look for a liver, and you also have a look for the gallbladder. Metastatic liver disease sometimes can come with jaundice, but you'll always find there will be a large liver. But carry can come, and they can, uh, that can come, and they'll also have a large liver. So when somebody comes with jaundice, you need to know whether they have. And in every patient with jaundice, kindly ask for a go and dig and ask history for a drug, drug intake, drug intake. Okay, and uh, please, uh, most of them will consider taking CAM as a normal routine. Today, I was just seeing a young lady who had come with us to join uh, John Chris. She said nothing, nothing till she said she for the last six months, she was staying a particular kashaya, which they, she thought it was a normal well-being. So these things, they will leave away. So kindly ask them and you should ask for all these uh, things. So once you finish the clinical examination, and then uh, how do you, then you classify whether it's a polystatic jaundice or hepatitis or you think there's a jaundice related to an underlying parenchymal liver disease and investigate along along those lines. Whenever you have a chronic parenchymal liver disease, you need to look for the clinical indicators of uh, any decompensation node or a chronic liver disease with or without portal hypertension. The one single clinical indicator of portal hypertension is I feel is always a spleen. Spleen is the one indicator for a portal hypertension. Aside is alone, cannot say that there's a portal hypertension in these, in these patients. So once you think, then you need to really classify what it is and then go through the what, what are the possible etiologies in this particular patient. This is what I think I will say how you approach a jaundice in a nutshell. Just want Madam or Yorgis Thomas sir to ask. Yeah, I think that that's the approach, no? So usually you will, the only problem that most of you face is when the patient what? has only some other, The other thing is sometimes if you are in a place where there are some tribals, tribal areas are there, always please keep in mind the hemolytic jaundice also. For us, nilgiris, when somebody comes with jaundice and splenomegaly, we would like to rule out thalassemia or 
or a sickle cell drain. So that's also the way they come from is also one approach. Madam, please. Yeah, so I think the only difficulty most of them face is the polystatic jaundice. So if a person has polystatic jaundice, always you have to consider both possibilities, intrahepatic and extrahepatic. And in a given patient, each one will have their own presentation. So if you have intrahepatic, the causes are very few. You just have the viral hepatitis, the drugs, the autoimmune, and then you have the Wilson. Wilson is more hepatocellular. So there are very few which have cholestatic. Whereas extrahepatic, you have about five or six situations. So see that you have a checklist for each of them, periampillary, juxtapapillary, distal cholangio, pancreatic head, hilar, gallbladder cancer, and nodes at the porta. These are about six causes here. And in that, all of them will be a close mimicker of intrahepatic. But intrahepatic cholestasis will have some something to say that either there's a prodromal symptom or there's a drug or there's a history of alcohol or there's a joint pain. You'll invariably get a cause for that. In its absence, then you start considering SOLs in the liver. So I think you should be very balanced in that. In your patient that you described, if you have not described about the chronic liver disease bit, you know, with any patient chronic liver, the first thing that happens is reduced urine output. You cannot say that the patient has had a normal urine output unless it's an outflow tract obstruction. Any patient with a liver disease, first thing, first thing that they will say they pass number of times of urine, but the quantum will always be low. So that is very, very important. So in your history, nothing is a passing statement, doctor, nothing. You cannot say four months back jaundice, then she went back to work and everything was normal. And then she noticed jaundice for one month. So that's where the history we lost. Actually, she has a disease all along. All along, she has yes. a disease. So okay. that is most important. So see that you don't get diverted at that juncture. If there is fever and pain, it is extrahepatic almost. It's almost diagnostic. But if there's no pain, no fever, then you have to balance between both intrahepatic and extrahepatic. And when you sit outside in the examination hall, you must have a table, have a ticks for the pros and the cons. And then so that when you're speaking out, we'll have to say based on the age, the weight loss, the loss of appetite and all this, put this puts this place as a neoplastic. In the neoplastic, is it intrahepatic or extrahepatic? For angiocarcinoma, yeah. intrahepatic is very, very uncommon, very rare. Very uncommon. Very rare. Oh. So it's most probably it will be just a high level cholangiocarcinoma that presents in this form. 80%, if you take cholangios, it's 80% is in the high limb and 20%, 10% distal and 10% is intrahepatic. So intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is just, just uncommon. Very, so very, 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 very. So once you know the prevalence, you have the figures in your fingertips. Then you can speak. You cannot say maybe rare. If that's not the way. Okay, you can uh, you can just go through this algorithm and then conclude. So what uh, one thing, one Sanjay, what you should remember here is we have shown you intrahepatic cholangiac curve. That means that does mean that everything is intrahepatic. You should always go your diagnosis with a statistical thing. If you take a cirrhosis, the most common will be hepatocellular It's not cholangio. So just because we've seen your cholangio, don't come and blurt out that we have cholangio. No. So you, at your level, you should know what is the statistic. If you have incidence, you should know what is the statistical thing of the incidence. That's why I told you, when you have an extra hepatic obstruction, this could have been a gallbladder malignancy, but that's a different issue. In South, if it is a gallbladder, even the right. But at your discussion, you should go by statistical. Most common is carcinoma head, periampillary, hilar cholangio, GB malignancy and distal cholangio. That's what will be the thing. So you should know that order. So here, when you have considered parenchymal liver disease, you are considering malignancy. Your first thing should be HCC, not cholangio. Then you should say it's a cholangio. We have made cholangio only by an imaging. And we kept on, I kept on thinking that it is just not a simple a uh, garden variety of chronic liver disease because there should be because of this there should have been some malignancy so even though the ct did not show but the subtle finding of central ihbr we went with an mri so you should know <laughs> the where are what you should know at what are the times you can miss hcc in a miss hcc or a cholangio then when do you do the other investigation so this part of theory you should know very very well and don't go blurted because we have shown one cholangiocarcinoma there so in your answers in the examination will be what is the most common. It may be wrong, but in your clinical discussion, I will think these are things are most common. So this is what is I want to convey to you so that you should know a complete this thing about it.
you want to go with the algorithm or madam wanted to So summarizing, if somebody has cholestasis with pain, if there is cholestatic symptom with pain, statistically more in chance of having an extra hepatic rather than intra -hepatic. Painless progressive jaundice, you have to have a list. intra as well as extra -hepatic, it is possible. So at bedside, if there is significant hepatomegaly, if there is palpable gallbladder, if there is a prior history of biliary intervention like ERCP or surgery, the chances of finding an extra hepatic is very high. The exception is alcoholic hepatitis where they have a significant hepatomegaly, they may have fever, they have leukocytosis, etc. And they may have cholestatic symptoms as well. That is perhaps the only exception. All the others in extra hepatic, there will be significant hepatomegaly. Intra hepatic, maybe mild to moderate hepatomegaly. That's it. Palpability of the gallbladder, we should always see whether the gallbladder is distended by inspection as well as palpation and the examiner will ask you how you examined how did you get it all those things may be asked okay so uh, that's in a nutshell i think uh, this is a very good case cirrhosis liver decompensation with an underlying neoplasm and as uh, professor Wenger said uh, cholangiocarcinoma even though it can happen it is much 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 low compared to development of hcc so I think we should say HCC and uh, polystatic symptoms are rather unusual unless there is a uh, additional uh, problem like a strategically yes. located over yes. yes. etc. Et Tendi ma'am, for final comments. One, uh, one question I just wanted. Sir, now uh, do we allow them to say subacute hepatic failure, which was uh, described during our uh, time of PG, madam? Yeah, yeah, they, they have acute hepatic. Yeah, yeah, anything beyond eight and twelve weeks, because for the DM hepatology which we had in uh, in our institution, both uh, Madhumita and uh, Raki both agreed to the term of subacute hepatic. Okay. They wanted that diagnosis. They wanted it. I think it's come somewhere in some ACD guidelines. Somewhere it is there. The subacute uh, subacute hepatic failure is predominantly our uh, continent. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Diagnosis. Yeah, his diagnosis. So, yeah. anywhere else, uh, the Japanese is caused called a subacute fulminant failure. Fulminant failure can be acute, subacute, chronic, but I think subacute hepatic failure. I think please read up. Uh, there is a book on tropical gastroenterology written by B.N. Tandon and uh, Dr. Nandi. In that, they have described this. So, kindly get that book and see that uh, subacute hepatic failure. Okay, ma'am. Okay, can we ma close this session? Uh, we can, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Thank, Thank, Thank you, Bye. Thank you. Okay, Sanjay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, uh, some areas will take improvement. I think uh, this is one of your first presentations. So history has to be edited. It's not exactly what the patient tell you because uh, we got digressed by the initial history like a patient oh, went to the doctor with cough, but told to have mild jaundice. He didn't go to the doctor again and again. Those probably could have been edited completely. Okay. Because it was probably not very relevant to our person. Because they will get immediately digressed to acute respiratory illness and all those stuff. Okay. So uh, things okay. which are probably not very relevant, you have to edit out. And uh, personal and edited story. And the negative will have to be relevant to the uh, first few DD which you are considering. Not the entire gamut of uh, the negative uh, symptoms. History, which yeah. in the you, need to, you need to talk about the negative history in relevant to the case. You Just because there's one uh, checklist, you can't be telling everything in every case. Okay? Uh, so negative history and, and negative findings also. Uh, it should be relevant to... Uh, so long the, uh, only the third year DMs were doing and, uh, presentation. Now I'll start for them. They have gone for a bit of a study leave now. Okay. And there is a difference between what we present in MBBS, where we present all this. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Oh, but correct. here it is a selective no. Selective no. And we give importance to that. And if you say an unselected no, you will not get any credit. 
Okay, that's the most important. We we assess you by telling uh, telling judicious negatives. Okay, so that that learning process is what we are really assessing whether you are applying enough uh, knowledge and enough uh, practical experience together. Okay, so I think as you present more cases, uh, you will go, uh, you will finally end up with a, a good presentation. There's nothing wrong with the presentation. There were too many details which probably required some more editing. That's all. So you need, okay. uh, you need to really think what is relevant to the case and produce. Because sometimes uh, you say something that the exam, you can easily digress the exam. And uh, we can ask you on that negative point. Then you'll fumble the next few few lines after that. So I think uh, you should. And inadvertently getting caught, for example, Telling 1,500 calories and her BMI yeah. is 14. And right? BMI is 14 points. Examiners point. are yeah. seasoned and sharp. <laughs> they know when to catch you. Okay. <laughs> so all these things, they will catch you. We'll be seeing but them. It will be very, very relevant. But suddenly they will pick up all these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we had a good discussion. It was a good case. Okay. Good night to all of you. Good night, sir. Good night, madam. Good night. Good night. Good night.